Look at the picture on the board right now. Tell me what you see. This is not a psychological test. Tell me what you see up on the board right now. You see what? Oh, sorry? An, okay, an X. Okay, sure. X marks the spot. Okay, what else do we see here? What's happened or is happening, Peter? Clouds? Okay, that's exactly what it is. Okay, it's, it's what we call... Actually, I'll see if anybody can figure out where those clouds came from. Okay, a jet trail. Oh, okay. Okay, you gave me more detail than I was expecting. An old jet trail and a new jet trail. We call those jet trails contrails sometimes, condensation trails, or really what it is is clouds, right? We think all this, all these emissions coming out of the airplane, all these emissions coming out of the uh, the factories on these cold winter days. Yeah, there's lots of stuff coming out of them, lots of emissions. But mostly what's coming out on a cold day is steam. It's water. It's water vapor. Okay? And it condenses and forms a cloud. That's what you see right there, is a cloud. Now, Emma told me that one was pretty recent here and one was older. What else do you notice about it? The fact that we have two airplanes that have gone by here, one pretty recently, one some time ago. What else can you tell me about these airplanes? Okay, so what? the fact that one is dispersed um, tells us probably that one is older, one is... One is newer. See anything else? Yeah, Peter. Okay, small because they're close together. Although it may be because they're far away from us that it appears to be close together. That's a possibility. Yep. Okay, so what does that tell you? Okay, it's going this way. We know the direction of the airplane. This one, I think, by a similar rationale, is going this way, although it's much less noticeable. Okay. How many engines does the second one have? Looks like two. This one is pretty hard to tell, right? Two engines right here. Uh, I think maybe two engines right here, but kind of kind of hard to tell there. Look, you guys just told me quite a bit about this picture, and my question was, tell me what you see. You haven't seen a single airplane in that picture yet. You were able to tell me that this is the condensation trail that follows two airplanes, one that went pretty much perpendicular to each other, one was above the other one, one was recent, one wasn't so recent, two engines told me they were going in these directions, told me all kinds of things about this without me even mentioning the word airplane or without you even seeing an airplane in the picture. We determined indirectly all these properties just by the cloud trail or the condensation trail that followed an airplane. What I want to talk about today is what I call, and this is only my name for it, not a, not a real name for it, what I call sub-sub-atomic particles. Sub-sub-atomic particles. Why do I call them sub-sub-atomic particles? Well, because up until pretty much now, you guys have always thought that protons, neutrons, and electrons are those fundamental particles that make up the atom. But guess what? Protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. They get smaller. There are protons and neutrons are subatomic particles. What makes up protons and neutrons I call sub-sub atomic particles. We're going to talk about those today. We're going to briefly talk about how you observe them, how to how to see them because of course they're so small that you can't see them with the naked eye any more than we can see these airplanes with the naked eye. We talk about how to observe them and then we're going to talk about a couple different families of these particles and then we're going to be done physics 30. All right so how do we observe these things? Well first we got to create them not create them per se but but liberate them from the protons and neutrons and how do we do that? Well in the typical guy machine we get them going to really, really high speeds, and then we smash them into each other to break them apart. Like I say this is a typical guy machine because if you pull nine guys out of ten and ask them, hey, what's inside that thing that you're having trouble opening up? What's a guy going to say? Break it. Break it. Um, smash it with a hammer. Break it up. That's what we do. You, you want to find out what's in a proton? Let's break it. Let's break it open. 
and see what comes out of the proton. Now, to do that, we have to collide protons together, but we have to move them really, really fast. Like, I'm talking like 99.99% the speed of light so that they have enough energy to overcome those attractive forces, those nuclear forces that keep them together. Think about this. You have two cars in a parking lot, both going at five kilometers per hour. They hit each other. What happens? Well, you might get a little dent, right? That's it. You get two cars colliding at 110 kilometers per hour head on in the highway. What happens? They break apart into a million pieces and they're destroyed. It's not what we want, but guess what? We just saw what made up that car, all these chunks of metal and steel that flew everywhere. We found out what made it up. We want to find out what makes up a proton. We better, get, we better not smash them together at slow speeds. We better smash them together at really, really high speeds so that we can overcome those bonds, those forces that keep them together. Does that make sense? Now, once we've done that, once we've smashed them together, once we've liberated these things that make up protons and neutrons, how do we observe them? Well, there's a couple ways. And I've got these outlined in your notes here. First way is called the cloud chamber. And this is basically, basically what you saw with the contrails uh, that followed the uh, airplanes. The cloud chamber, we have uh, this, in, inside this chamber where these particles are going to be produced, we have this, this air that's dust, like it's, it's purified. All the dust is taken out of it, but it's super saturated with something. So in other words, it's, it's ready to rain. It's ready to rain either water or alcohol. It's ready to it's it's ready to uh, condense and become water or alcohol. Now, these charged particles that ionize the molecules, these charged particles are the sub subatomic particles. These are the things that were produced when we smash the protons together. So we smash them together, it produces charged particles, and then these charged particles ionize the molecules of water or or uh, alcohol, and then these ionized molecules cause vapor. To condense it causes a cloud so what do we end up seeing well wherever these tiny little particles that are invisible to us are moving we see a cloud trail following it we don't analyze the, mo the, the particle itself because we can't see it but we can see the cloud trail that follows it just like just like right here couldn't see the airplane but we could analyze the cloud trail that followed it and therefore determine some of the properties of these airplanes. So you got this dust-free air that's super saturated, ready to rain alcohol or water. You get these sub-subatomic particles that have just been generated. They ionize the molecules, and then they cause the vapor to condense. It causes a cloud. The second way is the opposite. It's called the bubble chamber. Here we've got, instead of having air, like a gas, it's ready to become a liquid, we've got a, a liquefied gas. We've got a liquid. So instead of having a gas that's ready to become a liquid, we have a liquid that's ready to become a gas. Does that make sense? This gas is liquefied at low pressure, which lowers the boiling point. The boiling point is just barely above what we're at right now. It's just barely above the actual temperature of the liquid. Then once again, these sub-subatomic particles that have been generated when these protons or whatever it is smash together and break apart, they ionize the molecules. The ionized molecules cause not the vapor to condense, but they cause the liquid to boil, the exact opposite. If you have a gas that's ready to become a liquid, the ionized molecules cause it to become a liquid. If you have a liquid that's ready to become a gas, then these ionized molecules cause it to boil and become a gas. Now, instead of following the cloud path behind it, what do we follow? A bunch of bubbles. This one was like following the contrail of airplanes. This one would be like following, you know those uh, little lawnmowers that kids have that they walk on and they make the bubbles out there? You don't have to see the kid. You know where the kid's gone because you can follow the bubbles that are going behind the kid, right? It's exactly what it is on a different scale. This is an actual photograph of 
particles that have been generated in a cloud chamber. Like it gets pretty ugly, right? It gets pretty crazy. But you can imagine if we introduce magnetic fields, oh, we can determine whether it's positive or negative by which way they deflect. We can accelerate them in electric fields and measure speeds and do all kinds of manipulate manipulations to take some measurements of these, not just observe them, but measure some of the properties and then determine what they are, determine what makes up these things. Now, what are the particles though? This is the last thing, what are the particles? I got a little chart that summarizes it for you here. The chart's not in your notes, but the important parts of, of what you need to know are in, your, are in your notes, but some people work better from a chart than paragraph notes. There's a couple of classes of particles here, and we want to focus on simply one section on the right-hand side here. Now, you don't need to know everything even here. Okay? There's lots of stuff that you don't need to know here. I'm going to write down some stuff that you don't need to know. What I write down in red, you need to know. There are, in the class of particles that we need to know, there are two subcategories called leptons and hadrons. Leptons are not mediated by the strong nuclear force. That means they're not affected by the strong nuclear force, whereas hadrons are affected by the strong nuclear force. Now, there's six examples of leptons. They are fundamental particles. They don't get any smaller. An example of a lepton would be an electron. You need to know about electrons. Electrons can't be broken down into anything smaller. It is what it is, what it is. Now, along with the electron is an electron neutrino. That's a second type of lepton. Oops, spelling it wrong. You guys have learned about electron neutrinos. What did we call electron neutrinos? We called them neutrinos. We left off the word electron because it's the only kind of neutrino that we talk about. Now, there are other types of leptons as well that we don't need to be familiar with, but I'm going to give them to you for perspective. There's a muon. Again, this is in blue, so you don't need to remember that. And then there's a muon neutrino. Again, the neutrino that we've seen in beta positive decay that's an electron neutrino. It's the only kind of neutrino that we really need to know about. You can call it an electron neutrino, or you can just call it a neutrino. It's fine. There's another one called a tau, and then there's a tau neutrino. And, oh, just when you think you're done there. plus the antiparticles. Just when you think you're done, well, we are almost done. What's the antiparticle of an electron? An anti-electron or a positron. What's the antiparticle of uh, an electron neutrino? An electron antineutrino. We just call it an antineutrino. An anti-muon, although don't worry about that, anti-tau. Tau antineutrino. Okay, again, you need to remember what's in red. It's not part of it. It's it's a separate thing, right? It's a, it's in the same class, right? Electron. Then there's the anti-electron, the positron, the electron neutrino, or the electron antineutrino. Yeah, still under electrons. Yeah, but then we've got the hadrons which are not fundamental particles, they're made up of quarks. You ever heard that word quarks? Six types of quarks that we, we have. Only two that you have to worry about though. There's the up quark and there's the down quark. There's the top quark and there's the bottom quark. 
Scientists have observed all of these types of quarks. We know that they exist. When I went to high school, when I was your age, they had observed four of the five quarks, sorry, five of the six quarks. We thought the top quark existed, but when I graduated from high school, we hadn't observed it. Scientists hadn't observed the top quark. We have since. I shouldn't say we have. Other scientists have. And then there's the charm quark. These are kind of weird names, eh? The charm quark, the up, the down, the top, the bottom. The they keep getting stranger and stranger and stranger, eh? Who named these things exactly? I'll tell you what, though. There, are, there, there is no name that's stranger than the last name here. This name for this last quark is the strangest name that you will ever see in physics. Anybody want to take a stab at what it is? The top, up quark, the down quark, the top quark, the bottom quark, the charm quark, the, the what? What did you say? The side, quark. the side quark? Oh, it's stranger than the side quark. There is nothing stranger than this word. It's called the strange quark. I told you there was nothing stranger than it. There is literally nothing stranger than the strange quark. You don't have to remember that, though. Up, down, top, bottom, charm, strange, and, oh, and by the way, there's the antiquarks or antiparticles. The anti up anti quark, which you would think would be a down quark, but it's not. It's an antiparticle of an up quark. It's not like a poker thing, the anti up quark or anti up anti quark. It's an antiparticle of the up quark. Now, I'm going to write this in purple because you need to know this, but it's on, this part's on your data sheet. The charge is two-thirds, plus two-thirds of the elementary charge, and this one is negative one-third of the elementary charge. That's on your data sheet, so don't, don't panic about that. You need to remember, basically you need to remember electron, neutrino, up quark, down quark. But the charges you need to be able to use, you can find on your data sheet. Let's take a quick look at what you see here, guys. Beta decay. We're going to go back and explain beta decay in terms of quarks. Up, down, down. Look, up, down, down is two-thirds of the elementary charge, negative one-third, and negative one-third. What does that add up to give me? Zero. What is a charge of zero? What has a charge of zero? A neutron. An up is two-thirds. Two-thirds and negative a third. What does that add, to, add up to give me? Three-thirds. Or a charge of one. What is a charge of plus one? A proton. Plus an electron. Plus an antineutrino. This is beta negative decay, right? Where the electron leaves the nucleus. Remember we say beta negative decay occurs when you have too many neutrons? So a neutron kind of changes its composition from up, down, down to up, up, down, and then kicks out this electron in the process. Up, up, down, uh, what do we got here? Two-thirds, two-thirds, negative a third. What's that give me? Four, uh, three-thirds which is one, up, down, down is two-thirds, negative a third, negative a third, zero. What's that? That's a proton that changes into a neutron plus a, what's that? Postron plus a neutrino. Don't worry about this little thing right here. It's kind of an intermediate step that we don't go into quite that much detail. It's called the virtual particle. So what happens is that this proton changes into a neutron and a virtual particle, and then that virtual particle decays into a positron and a, uh, a neutrino.
But as far as you're concerned, it's a single reaction that takes place.